away. Okay, we're all ready to go when I do this then. Well, welcome everyone. This is a very exciting event for me. It's the first time that the Greens have tried to launch a policy online and I'm delighted that we have a uh, hundred people around Australia registered for this policy launch. Our policy is called Our Food Future and it really is a work of love and passion from the Greens and I'm delighted to be able to do it myself because I have a passion for this area of public policy. I was brought up on a dairy farm at Wesley Vale in northwest Tasmania and I led the campaign of the farmers there against the North Broken Hill pulp mill back in the end of the 1980s. And out of that came the mantra of clean air, clean water and uncontaminated soil as being qualities that are being lost around the world but so essential if we're going to be able to produce nutritious food into the future. At the same time, I've been fed up in recent years with the really poor deal that Australian farmers have had with very low farm gate prices and huge amounts of pressure from urbanisation from uh, coal seam gas, from expanded coal mining, from increased input costs and I'm going to talk about a few of those in a moment. But as a passionate environmentalist I've also been absolutely horrified by the impacts of accelerated global warming and what that's doing with extreme weather events around the world and exacerbating levels of global poverty and indeed famine. So we're entering a new era of food insecurity worldwide and that's why the Greens wanted to bring out a food plan which is holistic, which looks at the global context and the domestic context and has policy ideas which are internally consistent and costed. Now the way that we're going to uh, try to engage tonight is to have this launch in four sections. We're going to look at the global context, then sustaining the land and water in order to be able to uh, provide food. Thirdly, looking at what we have to do to keep farmers on the land. And then finally, looking at healthy and affordable food for everyone uh, to sustain ourselves as a human community. Now Imogen Burley is my staff member who's worked very hard on this policy and she's going to be online tonight and any questions that you send to me that I can't answer this evening then uh, I'll ask Imogen to reply uh, over the next few days and put up links and the like. So I'm going to address each of these four areas for a few minutes and then invite questions before I move on uh, to the next area. So the first thing I want to talk about is the global context. As you all know, we live on a finite planet and that planet is looking at a global population of around 9 billion by 2050. At the same time, we're looking at accelerated global warming which is cre creating uh, extreme weather events which is completely interfering in the way that we can provide food and this really came home to me in 2008 when there was a major shift in thinking because as a result of these extreme weather events around the world the grain price doubled. That led to a lot of countries saying well the problem here is that even if we want food and have got money to buy it it's not going to be available on the world market because in response to that food crisis many countries just banned the export of grain in particular. And that's led to an era of land grabbing around the world where countries that need to import food have started to buy land and water licenses around the world in Africa, uh, in Asia and but also uh, starting to happen here in Australia as well. That's not trade, that is outsourcing food production to be sent home to those countries uh, when scarcity really hits. So we need to look at that. 
We need to also look at the trade scenarios because free trade is not helping Australian farmers in many cases. It's making life unbearable because of the uh, import of cheap processed food in particular and we're seeing a loss of manufacturing in Australia and loss of viability in many of those farming communities. Now Australia will always be able to export food because the world's always going to need it but we need to make sure that we are producing enough of our own food so that we can feed ourselves a healthy and nutritious, nutritious diet and actually get out there and help others as well. In terms of being a responsible global citizen, this is where our foreign aid budget becomes important, that we actually go out there and meet our international obligations and use our aid money to assist particularly uh, women farmers around the world in developing countries so that they can continue to work on the land and produce food. It is a global social justice issue as well. So the Greens' commitments in relation to the global context are to commit to 0.7 of gross national income for overseas aid and to offer leadership through the G20 on issues around food security, to try to secure uh, fair trade rather than free trade and that means making sure that in any new free trade agreements there is a recognition of the cost of environmental compliance and the cost of meeting labour standards. We also want to reform the rules um, for foreign investment in Australia. I don't think we should be selling any of our agricultural land or water to the wholly owned subsidiaries of foreign governments. That is not in our interests or in fact in the, in the interests of social justice around the world in terms of actually providing food into global markets. And also we want to make sure that we uh, beef up our um, biosecurity arrangements in Australia. For too long, trade has, in my view, uh, compromised biosecurity outcomes. And so the Greens want to make sure that we have a national biosecurity authority which is uh, based on science and is independent and is not able to be uh, pressured by um, the trade agenda. That's the context for the, uh, the global scenario and I'd like to go over to you uh, for some questions in relation to that. So, they're just on their way, I'm being told. <laughs> it is important that we think as Australians not only in a domestic context but a global context and we also need to think not only about trade but as I said, securing the foundations of sustainable agriculture here in Australia. So these questions aren't coming up on the screen as yet. So while we're sorting out a few technical difficulties, I might move on to the second uh, part of our policy platform and that's protecting our agricultural land and water. It's obvious to everyone that if you can't sustain the land, it can't produce the food uh, that sustains us. We have an historical legacy in Australia uh, from a lot of land clearing and in fact uh, it used to be the case that farmers were required to clear land or else they weren't available for many uh, aspects of government support. So what we now need to do is recognise we do have a lot of degraded agricultural land, about 460 million hectares of farming land uh, and around 100 million hectares of that is already degraded. Now think of the environmental and productivity gains if we were to seriously tackle that land degradation issue. Equally, I think we have to realise, and I know this from my own experience talking to farmers, they want to be good stewards of the land, but 
they're not in a position very often to be able to put the money into fencing riparian vegetation, uh, getting rid of feral, plant, feral animals and weeds and so on and being able to manage connectivity in land corridors. We need to make sure that we assist farmers to be good stewards and that's why I was really proud that we were able to negotiate the, the uh, uh, biodiversity fund as part of the clean energy package so that we put over a billion dollars into assisting farmers to be able to look after the land. Also, it's important that we look after agricultural land and don't let it go under uh, urbanisation and don't let it be destroyed by expanded coal mining and coal seam gas. We actually have to do proper planning processes in Australia because we're losing land that's suitable for peri-urban agriculture and we are losing land and we are losing farming communities and the viability of those communities because of coal seam gas. So the Greens have said we want to maintain the funding for the Carbon Farming Initiative and the Biodiversity Fund together. That's 1.7 billion over six years. We want to stop unconventional gas and coal mining, expansion of coal mining. We want to invest in agricultural research and development. Uh, we're saying that there should be a $300 million increase over four years. That's 7% on current Commonwealth funding increase. We want to include the development of a Centre for Sustainable Agriculture to replace uh, Land and Water Australia, which we thought was a shocking decision when they axed that and we need to go back and put in a Centre for Sustainable Agriculture. And in terms of research priorities in that 300 million, we want to see agricultural land mapped, prime agricultural mapped to a scale that can inform local planning decisions. We want to investigate mechanisms in addition to the uh, Biodiversity Fund to pay farmers for environmental stewardship, for maintaining uh, bioregional standards and we want to see long-term bioregional monitoring of land, water and the health of our biodiversity. Now the, uh, I have a few questions here um, that uh, have come in. The first is, I've read that Australia is now a gross importer of fruit and vegetables. What do you expect the long-term impacts of this will be on our daily lives? Well, absolutely right. Uh, I think most Australians would be surprised to know that we've become a gross importer of fruit and vegetables. And I'm going to say a bit more about that later in terms of urban food deserts. But what it will mean in an era of food insecurity is that the range of foods that will be available to us to eat will be significantly reduced and we won't have the same level of access we now have to locally grown fresh seasonal uh, product and that is something that Australians need for our own health. Um, why spend on research and development when existing technology can feed both Australia and the world? That's a really good question and it's exactly why I wanted to do this food paper because the existing technology cannot continue to feed the world because it fails to take into account that climate change is altering uh, areas where food can be grown, it's altering which kinds, which varieties might be grown, it's also putting enormous pressure on the sustainability of land and water and we need to sort that out uh, as rapidly as we can and that's why you need research into uh, what climate change is actually doing and southwest Western Australia is a classic case in point where there have been significant changes because of changed uh, rainfall patterns and here in Tasmania we've had to have different varieties because we don't have the same minimum temperatures that we used to have and so you have to change your fruit varieties. Um, there's another question here. We already have substantial research and development funding for ag, but it's geared towards corporate interests. Peak industry bodies are not interested in smaller enterprises. Will that change? 
Well, there is some research and development that goes on in agriculture, and yes, a lot of it is in the larger corporates, but there is nowhere near enough publicly funded research and development in the public interest that's accessible to everybody who's trying to produce food, uh, and that's one of our key issues, that we make sure we get out there and support people at every scale in food production across Australia and especially research and development that's publicly available and deals with the changing uh, capacity of land and water to sustain us. Um, there's another question here about uh, the Greens will maintain recent reforms to drought assistance and ensure it's adequately funded. Um, in terms of drought assistance, Yes, it needs to be adequately funded, but again, we have to stop seeing drought as something that is a one-off for a long period or whatever, and then we can expect a whole lot of return to a different, you know, one in a hundred years. All that has changed. That's why the R&D in terms of uh, climate change is so important. I want to go on to um, keeping farmers on the land because some of the questions that are coming in relate to that. What I'm finding as I go around and talk to people around rural and regional Australia is that, first of all, farmers are ageing and they're worried about uh, who's going to take on the farm for the next generation or indeed whether they're going to be able to sell it. Also, there is very little promotion of agricultural careers uh, for young people. It's not in the national curriculum and there's a big uh, gap in the take-up at the tertiary level and in jobs that are available out there in rural and regional Australia. And soon we will have a crisis of the average farmer age is 55 and over. One of the other big issues facing people in rural and regional Australia, as I mentioned before, is the lack of a decent farm gate price. And that largely comes from the supermarket duopoly, which is strangling fair prices. And there's widespread evidence, and certainly a lot of it's anecdotal, but we've been asking for more research in this area of prices being forced down, undercutting local produce with cheap imports, uh, particularly for the generic brands. And Australians have been watching our own favourite local brands disappear from the shelves. And I don't want to see any more loss of local food manufacturing in Australia. That's a lot of jobs and it's undermining resilience in rural communities. Uh, for example, if we lost Simplot, then we would lose the last big national veg vegetable producer in the country. And we've seen uh, brands like Rosella go, and we've also had recent pressure on Ardmona. And in that context, uh, I have said that the Greens would support emergency anti-dumping uh, action to look at what is happening with these cheap imports. And I just hark back to what I said before about free trade agreements are not serving the best interests of farmers because no matter how efficient an Australian farmer is, uh, he or she cannot compete with an imported product where they haven't had to face that price of compliance on environmental standards and labour standards. We want to also um, look at how we would help people um, be able to work together at a smaller scale in regional food hubs. And that means um, promoting the brands that might come from a regional food hub. It means also setting up processing hubs so a, a group of farmers can actually access that infrastructure. And of course, promoting um, the opportunity that's come with the internet and the NBN for farmers and consumers to have direct relationships and that's so critical for um, this country and I think it's really exciting because people want to know and um, want to have a relationship with their the people who produce their food. In the US that was basically know your farmer, know your food and I'd love to see the same sort of thing in rural and regional Australia and city consumers. We also need to bring in bring down input costs and rising energy prices I know is a major input cost for farmers. And that's why we've said that we want to assist farmers to become more energy efficient and also to shift more to renewable energy 
and to bring large-scale renewable energy projects into the bush to enable farmers to have what I call you know, an extra crop in the rotation, except it's one that they can sit and watch happening rather than actually have to do the work themselves. As I mentioned, um, R&D is critical and uh, also the need to connect uh, farmers with those R&D uh, opportunities and so the key initiatives there uh, for the Greens are to get competition policy reform, so that is restore anti-price discrimination in competition law to address predatory pricing. We want to give the ACCC divestiture powers to break up market power concentrations. We want more resources for legal cases and we want to extend unfair contract law provisions to farmers and small business. In terms of helping farmers sell direct to support regional food hubs and put 100 million into energy efficiency and renewable energy as well as uh, agricultural R&D and of course mental health. One thing that hasn't been talked about very much but I'm conscious of because of the work that my colleague Senator Penny Wright has done is just the, the lack of mental health services out in rural and regional Australia and I know with rural communities under pressure uh, people are seeking assistance and often it's not available and that's something that the Greens want to make sure happens and I'm already very pleased with the work um, that has been done and, and Penny Wright will be making um, her survey results available a bit later in the election campaign. In terms of um, other questions, uh, there are a couple more here. Do you have any plans or ideas to make agriculture more attractive to the younger generation? I'm a 27-year-old female soil scientist and very aware that I'm rather demographically unique in the agricultural field. Well, that's right, except that um, there are an awful lot of young women going into ag science and we need to make sure that there are jobs for them out there in terms of particularly the research field and then uh, translating that research back so that it's practical assistance to farmers and as I said the extension of um, the field offices is one way we would like to do that but in Tasmania we're already seeing um, a, a lab in the northwest of the state doing tremendous work in terms of analysing soil samples and giving advice in terms of the optimum time to plant so as to reduce costs uh, and water inputs. What do you think about the true price of food? Are we paying enough for food? That's a really good question because this is where the Greens and the government disagree on future food security for this country because the government's food plan is based on the assumption that so long as Australians have uh, an adequate supply of cheap food then that's food security and it doesn't really matter where it comes from. Well what's happening is that the supermarkets are making it virtually impossible for farmers to make a living on the land. They're producing the food uh, importing a lot of it as I said, putting it out there and consumers are supposedly benefiting because they can buy uh, a cheaper food but in the long term it isn't cheaper because it's not going to be available locally and we're going to lose uh, jobs and productivity in Australia and the ability to feed ourselves but equally um, the other problem we have is that many people are not enabled to buy nutritious food and this is where our own health comes into it. We are what we eat and many people can't afford anymore to buy nutritious food because things like New Start, the support for people on unemployment, uh, the youth allowance for example, uh, single parent support have all been cut so that people are living so far below the poverty line that they can't actually go and buy the kinds of food that they might want to buy in order to feed themselves in a way that makes them healthy and I'm going to come to that in a minute. Um, how do we achieve information sharing between researchers and farmers rather than having R&D happen remotely in the lab and that's the point I made earlier about making sure we go, and go back to having field officers who are actually 
uh, acting in the public interest. They are not just the extension officers of the big uh, agribusiness corporates who are out there advising in terms of what their company is wanting to sell. We need to have the connection between public interest research and farmers that is going in the public interest. I want to now go on to putting good food on the table. As I said before, really important. Australia isn't actually monitoring food insecurity. The last time there was a proper national survey uh, was 2004. It's a forgotten issue, but we know from recent work by the Australian National University in Anglicare that up to one in ten Australians are regularly going without meals or can't afford to eat a healthy diet. You have to ask how can that be in a country like ours and some of what I said before about the support for, for people living on New Start, Youth Allowance, Single Parents, Disability Pensions and so on are in that category of people who just can't afford the kind of food that they would like to eat. At the same time we are struggling with obesity and a lot of diet related diseases. Uh, there's so much um, information on food but people can't make sense of it anymore and of course junk food is a lot cheaper than healthy food choices. We've also stopped teaching people the basics in terms of food literacy. You know, We used to have uh, home economics as it was called then in schools where people were taught the value of food and also how to prepare it. Nowadays it's very difficult for that to uh, even be part of the curriculum let alone something that everybody leaves school with a capacity to do. So we're saying that we need to get food into the curriculum so that people start to go back to having a real appreciation of where their food comes from, whether it's healthy or not and how to prepare it. We also need to make sure that we help farmers be able to sell direct as I indicated previously so that we can use the new technologies. You can have food delivered to your home directly um, from farmers who are producing it on the land or businesses which put together a range of fresh and seasonal food products and get it um, to your doorstep. But we also have to address food waste. This is a really big issue, not only in Australia but around the world. People say, oh, we're not producing enough food to feed the world's poor. Well, actually, we are producing an awful lot of food that is just wasted. So many people throw out a great deal of what they have in their fridges uh, after they've been uh, and done a big shop uh, at the supermarkets, for example. And so that waste though represents an awful lot of waste in terms of what our uh, land and our water and our farmer effort uh, that has gone into producing that food and of course it contributes to more greenhouse gases going to atmosphere. It really is awful to see so much waste, to see farmers having to rip out citrus trees for example because they can't compete with cheap imports and at the same time people around the world going hungry. We have to address this issue of the mismatch between where the food is produced, where it's consumed and people who simply have no access to food. Now the United Kingdom has led the way on food waste. There is a national campaign there to reduce it and to um, have a look at what is meant by the date labels on food and working with supermarket chains to restore the market for ugly fruit and vegetables. And wouldn't that be great? Because again, the supermarkets have this, uh, these rules around the perfect size for potatoes, for apples, for anything else. And so a lot of food is wasted and the community isn't even aware that they are the kinds of rules that supermarkets put on producers. And we want to make sure that we are supporting uh, organisations that are now moving in to assist farmers so that they don't waste their product and at the same time provide that product which is perfectly healthy and good 
to the people in the community who desperately need it. So from the Greens point of view, we want to uh, increase uh, New Start and support single parents and income management so that we enable people to be able to buy healthy food. We want to put food and fibre in the national curriculum and we want to fund another 800 uh, school kitchen gardens targeting particularly low income areas around the country. We wanted to put 20 million to address food waste including identifying where it's wasted in the food chain and how to give farmers a return on the surplus. We want to boost food emergency relief and funding and we want to fund also uh, adult food nutrition training because there has been a gap and there is a group of people in the community who really don't uh, really understand what food is nu nutritious and how it impacts on their health. We want to develop uh, national measures and mapping of food insecurity because there is very little awareness, uh, particularly with the planning of new suburbs where they have great planning for all of the takeaway outlets but very little in terms of accessibility to fresh food and that's why we've got what you would call urban food deserts appearing in parts of Australia and of course clear country of origin food labelling. I've got legislation in the parliament to deliver that after a long consultation with many people and I'm confident we will get that through in the next period of government. So they are really important initiatives uh, to try and assist at the end of the consumer with health, nutritious food and accessibility, keeping farmers on the land and then big picture policies in relation to changing the way we relate to free trade agreements, to national biosecurity uh, and the like. There's some more questions that have come in so I'll have a look at those um, as we, oh no, I've lost them here for a moment. <laughs> I'll just have, a, have a, uh, another look at that. Apparently not. <laughs> Just it's interesting for me in the Senate to hear people talk about uh, food security and not to have and at the same time not be prepared to address uh, the major extreme weather events around the world and the loss of food security that they that brings. Someone's uh, Jane's asked farmers markets help sustain farming families and farmland and boost regional communities. They increase access to fresh, healthy, seasonal and nutritious food and provide a guarantee of provenance. And the, the uh, information there is to go to that website to www.farmersmarkets.org.au and I totally agree. One great thing about farmers markets is not only do they uh, help farmers but they build uh, resilience in communities by bringing people together and that's always a good thing to do in rural and regional Australia. How do we prov uh, provide a fair price to farmers which needs to be more than they get from Coles and Woolworths and at the same time ensure a good healthy food is affordable for families on low income or government assistance? Well I think I've answered that. One is to make sure that we increase that uh, assistance for unemployed, for students uh, for single mums so that we are able to uh, enable them uh, to be able to buy healthier food. I was also asked uh, about palm oil uh, regarding deforestation and orangutan habitat. Very happy to answer that today since at the Adelaide Zoo the orangutans in the enclosure uh, chose me as the person they thought should win the election. I think the orangutans got incredibly good, good uh, um, sense when it comes to politics as it turns out. But um, in terms of food labelling, uh, first of all let me go to this issue of palm oil. 
one of the really big problems with food and food accessibility around the world has been the mandated uh, shift in food production to fuel production. And we have to stop that happening. And there's been massive deforestation in order to switch over to palm oil, particularly uh, in Indonesia, but also in Africa, in the Congo. But we're also seeing in uh, South America the same, where there's been massive areas of food production gone over to fuel. And one of the things we have to do is end that mandating in the European Union of 10% uh, on biofuels if they're unsustainable biofuels, which clearly they are if they're leading to deforestation. And on labelling of food, we not only want to see country of origin labelling, but also that issue of um, ethics, if you like, and that comes to issues of uh, things like palm oil and also uh, whether something is healthy or not. Um, in terms, I, I've got another question here about um, agricultural extension offices and we'll send out more information on, on how that would actually um, work. I'll just go on to just roll it up. So. Okay. Um, there's some someone has written to say that they have work for people who might be um, w uh, supported uh, through disability services and offering um, some work for people uh, in that regard and I'll make sure that that gets passed on uh, to uh, the, the disability services. I've got a question here about soils and I think it's really important. If our soils don't have the required nutrients and minerals, the essential elements will not end up in our food. This is where farmer knowledge and that of the consumer needs to lift and R&D and extension services are a priority, surely. And that's right. Part of uh, addressing the food task is to look at how do you maintain uh, uh, your soil quality and how do you minimise the water inputs because they are going to be the big challenges and maintaining soil health means that you really, we really have to change agricultural practices in many cases and um, I'm really pleased that for example we've gone to, uh, to no-till agriculture in many places and we're seeing a shift away from such a heavy chemical dependence and improved soil carbon and soil carbon is a great thing for us to um, be working to improve because it, it um, leads to improved water retention in the soils um, and it, it therefore reduces input costs and you get that microbial activity and you get real soil health coming back. But it isn't a silver bullet in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and this is where I have a real point of difference uh, with Tony Abbott saying that he's going to try and achieve almost all their greenhouse gas reductions from uh, soil carbon that won't work because in extreme drought you're also going to lose a fair bit of your soil carbon and we don't want to have farmers exposed to costs that they might have to incur later if they lose that soil carbon during extreme weather events. But it's a good thing to do to shift over to more biological systems, healthier soils. You're going to have not only a um, healthier product but it's going to have a lot of those minerals, trace minerals that people really need. Um, to have. Uh, there's a question here from Bart, what is needed to be done right now to save SPC and other processes before it's too late? Well I agree and that's um, people came to see me from the community there and from the processor, basically grower, people working in the factory and so on and they all argued that what we needed was um, emergency uh, invoking of the anti-dumping provisions to give them an opportunity to address the scenario and I agree with that. But ultimately the only way we're going to keep food processing jobs in Australia is to address the flood of cheap imports and that will only happen if we actually take on these free trade agreements. 
and that's where the Greens have argued very strongly that all free trade agreements should be rewritten to include those costs of environmental compliance and labour standards so that Australian farmers get a fair go. Just before we rose um, for the winter break this year and coming into the election, I secured an undertaking from the government that before any new free trade agreement is negotiated that there would be reports about it um, put in the in the uh, parliament uh, to, to outline the benefits and the costs so that the community could have a look at that before it actually went any further. At the moment the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement is being negotiated. Most people in Australia have no idea that that is happening and I believe it's the Americans coming back to get what they didn't get in the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement negotiations and I would urge everyone to take a keen interest in this because as the Productivity Commission uh, wrote recently, all the claims that were made about the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement back in 2004 didn't come to pass for agriculture and Mark Vale at the time had said there would be hundreds of thousands of jobs in it and uh, for Australian farmers and rural communities. It just didn't happen and it won't happen. Um, Another question on food labelling. Uh, will we continue to push for food labelling? Are we willing to work with other parties such as CADA, the DLP and Xenophon to achieve a win for common sense and give consumers an informed choice? Absolutely. Uh, I brought in that legislation because I'm sick of hearing that it can't be done. Having brought it in, we went to a Senate inquiry and as a result of consultation, uh, with everyone from Choice to the Manufacturing Workers Union to uh, Ausveg um, to the Made in Australia campaign. We talked to everyone. We brought in a piece of legislation which I think now solves all those problems and we are now, uh, we've got that legislation in and I will work with whoever I need to work with to get it through. The real question is will we get support from either uh, the Labor Party or the Coalition because when it comes down to it the reason they don't support food labelling is not because we can't overcome the complexity of it, it's because of the power of the big corporates who don't want food labelling because they want to be able to continue to disguise where um, the product in the tin or in the packet actually comes from. And if you look at um, tomatoes, it's a classic case where Chinese tomatoes are going to Italy. They're being put in cans in Italy and labelled as Italian tomatoes and then they're brought into Australia. And you have to ask, how is it possible for that to be cheaper than canned tomatoes in Australia? And it's because the Europeans, the Italians, are massively subsidising their industry and that's where Australia has to just get real about the fact that we are, there is an ideological commitment here to free trade that does not exist anywhere else in the world and it's doing our farmers in. Um, how do the Greens think urban agriculture can contribute to sustainable food production? That's a great question and um, I think it's really important. When I bought my house in Hobart, it's got a very small garden and I wanted to show that you could grow some of your own food uh, no matter how busy you are and I think one of the advantages of doing that is it makes you realise just what goes into producing food and it makes you a lot more grateful for the work that farmers do. So I think urban agriculture is really important. I think uh, community um, gardens are really also extremely important and that feeds into um, farmers markets and you'll get a whole community and then working together to grow some of their own food and also to support farmers markets and what we're now seeing a lot more of with innovative urban design is more and more uh, architects are making plans for rooftop gardens for enabling people to be able to engage in some form of uh, community garden or individual gardens in the buildings they work and in fact it's become the new black. When you go to uh, meals at people's places they very proudly say I grew this or I grew that. It's now become something people are 
conscious of and want to support. In terms of the Greens having the balance of power, Jack from New South Wales has asked if the Greens have the balance of power again, what will be your priority to push through for farmers? Well, a lot of, uh, a lot of priorities, but as I've said, the first one is on foreign ownership of agricultural land and water. I think it's awful that one third of Western Australia's water licences are already either fully or in part foreign owned. I don't think it's a good idea to be selling our agricultural land and water to any country because uh, many of these companies are actually wholly owned subsidiaries of foreign governments, whether it's the Saudis, whether it's the Qataris, whether it's the Chinese or whoever. So foreign ownership is a, an issue and I've got legislation on that as well saying no, no to any sale of uh, subsidiaries of foreign governments and a much reduced threshold for other um, interest and a national interest test to look at that. In terms of free trade, I've just mentioned that. In terms of country of origin labelling, we've got legislation in and on the supermarket duopoly, we are going to move on all those changes on competition policy as well as to put money, as I've just uh, indicated, into research and development. They would be the big picture items, particularly research and development and extension offices, but also uh, support for food hubs for uh, branding um, in regional areas. All of the initiatives are actually set out on the, on the back of the food future of how we would um, structure the spending and these are fully costed initiatives by the Parliamentary Budget Office going into the election and that'll all be up on our website. Um, what about lock the gate, protecting our farms? Well, I'm a big supporter of lock the gate. I've been up to um, several of the areas that are under threat from coal seam gas. Uh, I've been up to um, the Darling Downs, the Liverpool Plains, been out to Moree, I've been uh, up to the Felton Valley, talking to farmers everywhere and they feel uh, absolutely under pressure because they want to protect the land that they've worked on for generations and, and coal seam gas uh, means that, that they're having at the, an inability to just say no you can't come on the land and I think they should be able to say no you can't come on the land and there was an elderly gentleman I met on the tour and he said to me you know uh, I'm in my mid-70s and I've spent all my life building up the farm. I didn't ever think I'd have to spend the rest of my life defending it. And that's tragedy for rural and regional Australia. And when you think about if, if Lester Brown, and I believe he is right, when he says that uh, food is the new oil, the geopolitics of this century are going to be dominated by food, therefore land and water are the new gold, why on earth would you compromise that for fossil fuels? That coal and that coal seam gas should stay in the ground and we should maximise our opportunities to keep our land productive and not have it destroyed uh, by the fossil fuel sector. Um, Great to see food and fibre in the school curriculum and 800 school gardens. Will teachers be taught about rural and food and fibre? Again, this is having it in the curriculum will mean that you'll get a number of teachers coming into the system who've got backgrounds in ag science. Uh, in, the, in the Senate, my colleague Rachel Seawitt from Western Australia is an agricultural scientist. And um, in fact, in the Greens, many of us do have a background uh, on the land and Peter Wish Wilson, my colleague here in Tasmania, uh, has a vineyard and of course and my own experience is on the land. But I really think if we can get it into the curriculum, food and fibre into the curriculum, together with an understanding of climate change, an understanding of the uh, trends in terms of um, water being such a big issue in this century, then we will get young people coming out of universities with ag science degrees going into classrooms and I think that would be a great thing. Um, the next question is what do the Greens propose 
re the ownership of seeds. GM, especially GM wheat, has been rejected in 2004 USA and Europe, yet there's pressure on trials happening here in Australia. Well, the Greens have taken the precautionary principle to heart when it comes to um, genetically modif modified um, foods or GE. And what we have said is that there is a real, the onus of proof needs to go with GM, not the other way around. And what we have uh, said in the Tasmanian context, we are GMO free, and the Greens have taken a very skeptical view of uh, GE because essentially it means that those corporates have so much power and uh, the whole concept of the terminator gene was something dreamt up by those corporates in order to secure the profitability from seeds into the future for three or four companies worldwide and that is a social justice issue and I spoke to many of my colleagues uh, in international fora particularly um, from India and they were horrified at the notional view that farmers would no longer be able to sustain themselves because the ownership of seeds would go from the common interest to the corporate sector. There are a lot of issues to, to be discussed in terms of GMOs but that's the position the Greens take. Um, food is so important yet you bang on about farmers markets. No one has a problem with farmers selling their produce however they want but we know they want to do what they want to do and that is farm not retail. Farmers need a viable option and we want to get it to them. Help us help farmers and consumers. Absolutely one of the big issues for farmers though has been that they have felt that they've got no other option but to take the price uh, that's been offered by the big supermarkets and that's why we need to help them to find ways around those supermarkets and that's why um, retailers offering that connection uh, is really important and as I said before the internet enables um, producers of food to be able to connect with consumers or with retailers who then get it to the consumers and get around the big supermarkets. Um, will the Greens policy federally send a signal to the states loss of prime farmland because of coal seam gas, coal and urban sprawl as well as large parcels sold off to investors who simply want to grow commodities for export is a huge issue. Well certainly um, this is something that I have pursued in a state context and national context. Um, the parcels who want to sell it off to, uh, to investors, I've said before, we want the land to be looked after and it, for it to be farmed and for that uh, food to be sustainably produced and that's where we're going to be putting our efforts and certainly in terms of planning schemes we've made it very clear. We want to see the Commonwealth take a much stronger role in mapping um, agricultural land and three-dimensional mapping in terms of impacts um, on coastal areas but also looking at different climate trends around the country so that we can help anticipate the changes in um, production that people may or may not be able to implement into the future depending on what the long-term trends are. I just wanted to uh, to, uh, it looks like we're just about out of time. So I just wanted to say to you all, when I took over the leadership of the Greens, I said I wanted to have more of a conversation with rural and regional Australia because I do believe that we have so much in common. Uh, we want to sustain the land, we want to keep farmers on it, we want to make sure that consumers uh, have healthy, nutritious food and that Australia's food supply is secure into the future, but equally to use the generosity that we ought to be giving in the developing world to help them be able to be sustainable and self-sufficient in terms of food and keep, keep women farmers um, on the land there. If you want to see um, these issues discussed in a global context, the only way that's going to happen in the parliament is if the Greens are there. And that's why it's so important the Greens maintain their role 
as being a, a spokesperson for the future, for adaptation to climate change, for changing agricultural practice and be loudly outspoken for changes in the curriculum, changes to big picture uh, ownership and trade laws. And that's why I'd ask that you have a look at this plan that we've launched tonight and respond to it, engage with it. It's a, I think it's a document we can be very proud of and I want to thank you for engaging with it tonight and I look forward to seeing you as I move around Australia during the election campaign. Thank you for your support to date and I ask you at this election to put the Greens first in the Senate because we want to make sure we put your interests right at the fore of public policy, not only in this next period of government, but we're thinking for the next 50 years. Thank you and good night everyone.